Many students often go into the exam feeling unprepared, not sure what to expect and how to approach the questions given. So I thought it would be helpful to share some valuable tips and guidelines on how to answer exam questions. So in part two of this exam prep series, I'm going to be focusing on answering structured and essay type questions. So these include those simple questions that require short answers, often involving diagrams, and then there are those questions that usually require a fair amount of writing. So if you need help in this area, keep watching. Now here's a quick look at the exam format for the CSET Biology Paper 2. So it's important to note that the structured questions are the second two questions in section A. And then in section B, you have three extended response questions to work on. So each of these questions are 15 marks. Now for human and social biology, in section A we have three structured questions and then in section B you only have two extended response questions and they're also each worth 15 marks as well. And all of these type of questions are testing your use of knowledge. So in terms of testing, what exactly are CXC testing when they bring these structured and essay type questions. So the knowledge is one area they'll be testing for sure to see your ability to remember, identify and grasp the meaning of basic facts, concepts and principles. So it often involves identif identifying parts on diagrams. Then you have comprehension. So that's basically just understanding what you've learned. So be being able to select appropriate ideas compare and cite examples of facts, concepts, and principles in familiar situations. And then thirdly, application. So it's important for them to see that you can apply your knowledge to both familiar and new situations. And then finally, problem solving. So this often may come in the essay type questions where you have to use your knowledge and understanding to offer solutions. So these are some of the things that CSC would be testing for when they bring the structured and essay response questions. Now here's a few exam tips that I want to look at to help you to go into the exam and be able to answer the questions properly. So first of all, you need to read instructions carefully and understand what exactly is required of you. So what I'm going to do later on in this video is go through some common instruction words that you really need to understand what it is CXC is asking of you in the question. Secondly, you want to answer only what the question asks, no more and no less. So you really don't want to be wasting time writing out an answer that has nothing to do with what the question is asking. Thirdly, you can make a note of the number of marks. Check for that because that would usually help you to get an idea of how much you need to write. So check the number of marks for each question. So let's look at some common instruction words that usually come on the exam paper. So we have the words that would often test knowledge and comprehension. So this would include list, identify, name, state, define, outline, describe, and then you have those words that would test your use of knowledge. So that would include suggest, differentiate, explain, and discuss. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to break down these words a little bit and give you some examples of questions using these common instruction words. Okay, so let's look at the first one, list. So this is basic. You give points with no explanation or reasoning. So usually just single words. So for example, if I see a question saying list the seven characteristics of all our living organisms, you just have to simply list them. So nutrition, respiration, excretion, movement, irritability, growth, and reproduction. That's all you need to give. So there's no explanations or anything, you're just listing. So the next set of words, identify, state, or name. So basically you'll be showing and pointing out facts or label parts on a diagram. So for example, identify three features common to all respiratory surfaces. So that would include having a large surface area, that's one feature. Secondly, having thin membranes. And then thirdly, the moisture lining. So you see there's no explanation or anything. 
So you're just identifying the three features. So almost similar to listing in a sense. Another example, so name the part of the brain that controls involuntary actions. So that would be the medulla oblongata. So you're just giving one answer there, no explanation. Third example, state the processes in the diagram of the water cycle. So I'm going to insert a clip of a past paper question that actually covers this particular um, question. Okay, figure five is a diagram of the water cycle. So you're seeing the different stages of the water cycle and you're asked to state the processes that occur at A, B and C. So A, as you can see, indicated by the arrows going up to the clouds, and you have the trees down below, that would have to be transpiration, which is the loss of water vapor from plants and trees. So that is transpiration. B, now we have the loss of water vapor from the sea through evaporation. So that water evaporates, and then it goes into the clouds. Clouds undergoes condensation, which is prior to precipitation, which would be the release of the rain from the clouds. So evaporation would be B. And then C, as you can see the arrow indicating, that would represent the surface runoff. So water, not all the water would get deep down underground. Some of it would run off from the surface of the ground, and that can enter into the, the sea. Alright, let's look at the next instruction word, define. So that means to give the meaning of a term or a process. So the example I have here, so define the term photosynthesis. Now for two marks, you want to make mention of two points. So photosynthesis is the process by which green plants make their own food, so that's pretty much one point, and then using sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, those are the raw materials. So that is a complete definition there of photosynthesis. So we have the actual process, what it does. So it makes it own, it allows plants to make their own food. And then you use the raw materials, sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. So that is a definition there. Now the next instruction word, outline. So with outline, you're given a brief description of steps or stages in a complex process. So you're kind of like summarizing the basics for a particular process. So an example I have here, so outline the stages in blood clotting after getting a cut. So this is four marks. Now I have the answer as follows. So when the cut is formed, platelets and damaged capillaries produce thromboplastin. So that's point one, and then that thromboplastin is going to work on the prothrombin, converting it into thrombin. Then the thrombin acts on soluble fibrinogen, converting it into insoluble fibrin threads. So these are the threads that are going to form the actual clot, which traps the blood cells. So this entire process requires the nutrients calcium and vitamin K. So that completes the outline. So it's just a quick summary of the stages of blood clotting. All right, let's look at the next instruction word, describe. So this is often used. So you have to outline the main details of a process. So the example given here, describe the test to investigate if starch is present in a leaf. Four marks. So pretty much you should have in your mind, okay, you may need to write at least four points. So to test a leaf of starch, so you're going to be using the iodine test. So that is the name of the test that will investigate the presence of starch in the leaves. So first of all, the leaf should be taken from the seedling and placed in a beaker of boiling water to break down the cell membranes or the walls. So that's what's going to allow the iodine to actually get into the, the cell. And then secondly, you need to turn off the Bunsen burner. So remember the water that's boiling would be upon a, a tripod. You have the beaker on top of the Bunsen burner heating it. So at this point, you're going to turn off the Bunsen burner and place the leaf in a boiling tube of ethanol standing in the hot water. And this is going to extract the chlorophyll. Thirdly, you're going to remove the leaf from the ethanol and place on a white tile or a petri dish. And then the last step, you're going to add a few drops of iodine. So if the leaf turns blue-black, that means that starch is present. 
So that describes the tests that you would use to investigate if starch is present in a leaf. So let's look at another example of this instruction word describe and I'm going to insert a clip of a past paper solutions that actually answers this particular question. Okay, it says in part A, describe how genetic engineering is used to produce human insulin using the bacterium E. coli. So you have to consider the whole concept behind genetic engineering in which you're manipulating genes. You're taking genes from one organism and adding it to the genome of another organism. So in this case, in order to produce a human insulin, the human insulin gene would be extracted from the pancreatic cells. So remember the pancreatic cells are responsible for producing the hormone insulin. So the gene, the human insulin gene is taken from the pancreatic cells and then the plasmid DNA of the bacterium E. coli. So remember DNA, the DNA in the bacterium exists as these plasmids, they are circular DNA. So this DNA is going to be cleaved are cut by restriction enzymes so that is going to remove a section of it so that the insulin gene from the human cells the pancreatic cells can then be inserted and integrated into it to form recombinant DNA so you're going to have a combination of the human insulin gene and the bacterial genes so the bacteria with the recombinant DNA so it's a mixture of the two Human, ins human insulin and then the bacterial plasmid DNA. So that recombinant DNA is going to be, the bacteria with the recombinant DNA would be placed in fermentation tanks and that's where they're going to multiply rapidly. So as they are multiplying, the insulin gene would also be quickly produced in the process. So this, this produces large quantities because remember bacteria, they multiply very rapidly and produce large quantities. So the scientists are then going to harvest these bacteria carrying the human insulin and extract and purify it before it can be used as medicine for diabetics. So I am going to include a diagram here just showing you the whole process of human insulin production. So you see the stages we just went through. So we have the human pancreas cell with its DNA and then we have the bacterium, the E. coli. So you see you have bacterial DNA and then the plasmid DNA is the round one. So you're pretty much going to be merging the two types of DNA, the human insulin DNA and then the bacterial DNA, the plasmid DNA. So that is what forms the recombinant DNA. So before that, obviously, we would have had to cut the section from the bacterial DNA, the plasmid DNA, before we can combine it with the human insulin gene. So once that occurs now, it's going to be placed back into the bacterial cell. So now we have a new bacterium, a recombinant bacterium. So we have the combination of the human insulin genes with the bacterial genes. So now this is the point where it's going to be, the bacteria will be placed in the fermentation tank where multiplication will occur. So they are going to be re reproducing very quickly. That's how bacteria reproduce, very, very quickly. So then the more bacteria produce, obviously, the more human insulin will be produced. So here we have the human insulin produced and then from there, the insulin needs to be extracted and it needs to be purified before it can be used as medicine for diabetics. So that is just the overview of how human insulin is produced using the technique of genetic engineering. So All right, let's move on to the next instruction word, suggest. So it means to put forward ideas or tips and measures based on your knowledge. So sometimes it would often ask the question, what do you think best? What do you think is best? Or why do you think that occurred? So a good example here suggests why plants wilt during the day and recover at night. So that is two marks. So it's causing you to think, to apply your knowledge and understanding of plants and what can happen during the day. So the answer for that, so during the day, the sun is obviously usually out, making the temperature higher that can lead to increased loss of water through the process of transpiration and this would cause the leaves to wilt. 
So at night, when the temperature is cooler, the leaves can actually retain water better, therefore recovering to normal condition. So that pretty much is, is the answer that you can give explaining why you think something occurred. So in this case, why you think plants wilt during the day and then recover at night. So you're just suggesting. So it's not necessarily facts. It is just basically your, your opinion, what you think may happen. All right, the next instruction word we're going to look at, discuss. So this is a very common one, especially in the essay type questions. So this is where you would present your opinions and knowledge on a particular matter. So for example, discuss the health effects of hypertension on the cardiovascular system. So in this particular question, you'd be mostly presenting your knowledge on the matter, what you know about hypertension and how it affects the cardiovascular system. So let's look at the answer I have here. And as you can see, five marks. So you have to write a pretty fair amount. So first of all, you're gonna, it's good to give a definition first of what hypertension is. So hypertension is having high blood pressure, which increases the force of blood against the walls of, our arter of the arteries. So then in going on to the effects now, so one effect is it damages the artery walls, making them more likely to attract fatty plaques, which build up and lead to reduce elasticity of the walls and narrowing of the lumen. So that's about three different effects there mentioned. So you have the damage to the artery walls, attracting fatty, the fatty plaques and reducing elasticity in addition to narrowing of the lumen. So then as a result, you're going to have the blood flow being impaired. So it's going to be interrupted as the lumen of the arteries becomes smaller over time. So this is going to cause a raise in the blood pressure even more as the heart is now going to have to work harder to force blood through the narrow arteries. So if hypertension affects the coronary arteries, so these are the arteries outside of the heart, supplying the cardiac muscle with nutrients and oxygen. So if the hypertension affects the coronary arteries and, and the arthrosclerosis, because that is what is meant by the buildup of the fatty plaques, that's what occurs when the fatty plaques build up. So when that affects the coronary arteries, that can actually lead to a heart attack because you're going to have less blood supply to the cardiac muscle. So we see a number of effects here being produced because of hypertension. So basically hypertension can cause atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis can cause hypertension. So it's like a domino effect occurring. So these are some of the effects that you can discuss. So you have to make a number of points in order to get the full marks. All right, the next word, differentiate. So if differentiate, it simply means to distinguish between two or more terms, particularly by stating the differences. So the example I have here, differentiate between diffusion and active transport. So these are two different types of cell transport processes. So we want to give the differences between the two. So this question is worth three marks. So let's see how we're going to answer it. So first of all, I have diffusion is the passive movement of solute molecules in gas or liquid from a high concentration to a low concentration. Well, active transport is the movement of solute molecules from a low to high concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. And then my last point is active transport requires energy well, diffusion does not. So active transport needs energy to move the molecules against the concentration gradient. Diffusion is a passive process, so no energy is needed. And then another difference you can also mention, um, diffusion doesn't necessarily need a cell membrane, a semi-permeable membrane, but active transport does. So these are some points that you can make in order to differentiate between the two cell transport processes. So let's look at the last instruction word I'm going to focus on, explain, provide reasoning, give theory, or describe steps to a process. And the example I'm going to use, explain how the body converts starch into glucose. So I'll insert another clip from a past paper solution video. Unlike plants, animals are unable to synthesize glucose. A boy eats a meal of cassava, 
I explain how his body converts the starch in the cassava to glucose. Name the organs and the enzymes involved in this process. So to begin with, we're going to start with the mouth. This is where the boy is going to ingest the cassava. So the cassava is going to be first broken down into small pieces by his teeth. This is known as mechanical digestion. The saliva in his mouth that contains salivary amylase would actually begin the process of chemical digestion. So this is when you have the enzymes breaking down the large molecules into smaller molecules. So you're going to have the starch being broken down into maltose. So now the next organ involved would be the stomach. So after the, the cassava, the bolus of food goes down the esophagus through peristalsis, the stomach is going to be involved in churning and mixing that cassava meal. So no further chemical digestion is going to occur within the stomach as it relates to the cassava particularly. Now moving on to the small intestines, the pancreatic juice from the pancreas contains pancreatic amylase. So this will also continue with the digestion of the starch in the cassava, converting that into maltose again. And then that maltose needs to be further broken down by the enzyme maltase which converts that maltose into glucose. So the maltase enzyme usually comes from the, the juices secreted from the intestinal walls. And once the glucose has been produced from the breakdown of the maltose, then that is now ready to be absorbed across the walls of the small intestines into the blood. So then the blood will be responsible for transporting that glucose around the body. So that question is worth four marks. If you have any questions, feel free to comment them below and I'll be glad to answer them. If you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe, like, and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell.